innovative action and partnerships to deliver on the 2030 agenda, which is being held as a side event to the ECOSOC Partnership Forum. Before I start, I just wanted to let you know that live captions with translation are available for this event. Attendees can look in the chat for instructions to enable this feature. As you all know, the 2024 Partnership Forum uh, of ECOSOC, which will be held throughout the day today at the UN headquarters in New York, has a theme of reinforcing the 2030 agenda and eradicating poverty in times of multiple crises, uh, with a focus on the effective deliver delivery of sustainable, resilient, and innovative solutions. The forum will place emphasis on the SDGs that will be reviewed at the 2024 HLPF in July, which is goal one on poverty, goal two on zero hunger, goal 13 on climate action, goal 16 on peace and justice, and goal 17 on partnership for the goals. The partnership forum is focused on the exchange of new ideas, expectations and priorities for the work ahead for ECOSOC and for the HLPF. And it will showcase and discuss forward-looking actions by countries and all relevant stakeholders through innovative partnerships that can mobilize commitments and actions to advance the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and address new challenges. And this event is going to zoom in on SDG 16 plus. As we're now in the second half of the 2030 agenda's implementation, we believe that it's critical for the international community to come together and act on realizing more peaceful, just and inclusive societies as a catalyst for progress across the entire 2030 agenda and as a means of addressing continuous global crisis, driving breakdowns in trust at all levels. Unfortunately, most of SDG 16's targets are off track or backsliding. And therefore in this context, it's absolutely critical to harness the power of innovative partnerships and collaborative action to amplify results, scale interlinkages between SDG 16 and the other SDGs and build resilience against future crises. So in recognition of all this, this event, which is hosted by the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies, the TAP Network and International IDEA, we will highlight these innovative partnerships and policy solutions that practically advance SDG 16 plus and its interlinkages across the entire agenda including on climate and poverty, with a focus on national and subnational levels uh, in member states. And with support from other global SDG 16 plus coalition members from the UN and from civil society, the event will also emphasize the need for a multi-stakeholder approach, innovative financing and improved data to better understand both the trade-offs and to measure the results. So um, the event will feature speakers from across the SDG 16 space and from within the global SDG 16 plus coalition. It will also include an interactive dialogue with participants, um, including through the use of um, presentation tools such as a Mentimeter uh, that will come uh, throughout the middle of the session to ensure that we have an interactive um, dialogue on central issues to SDG 16 plus and the 2030 agenda. Today, we have the great honor to have with us as a keynote speaker, um, Her Excellency Minister Kenya Barley, Minister of Economic Development and Planning in Sierra Leone. And we also have a great panel with us composed of Paula fernandez Wolf, who's the Director General of the 2030 Agenda of the Government of Spain. We also have with us Anne Romsas, who's the Chief Advisor on SDGs uh, for the Norwegian Association of Local Governments. We also have with us Elizabeth Hume, the Executive Director for the Alliance for Peacebuilding and TAP Network Co-Chair. We also have with us Swati Mehta, who's the Program Director of Justice for All at Pathfinders, and John Romano, who's the Director of the TAP Network. So without further ado, and here I first need to check that Minister Barley, who was busy this morning uh, getting um, the, the seven-year development plan of Sierra Leone approved in Freetown, that she has been able to make it to, to, to the event. Otherwise, we'll go directly onto the panel with we'll switch Minister Barley to have her speak after the panel. Could you just let me know if Minister Barley is online? Yeah. Wonderful. So I'll give the floor to Her Excellency Minister Barley, uh, Minister of Economic Development and Planning in Sierra Leone. Over to you, Minister.
Um, Annika, I don't think, um, Lynn, I saw you nodding, but I don't think the minister is on quite yet. So perhaps we should move to um, uh, Paula. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we will have Minister Barley speak after the panel. We'll go directly on to the panel then, and we will start with the first panelist. Oh. The minister is here. Yes. Yes, wonderful. Minister, we look forward to hearing you. Over to you, Minister. Okay. Yes, in fact, um, I am in the hall where we just launched, it wasn't approved, we just launched um, the medium-term national development plan. It was launched by the president. We had parliamentarians, other ministers and things like that. So I'm still a bit uh, sweaty and breathless, uh, but of course, you won't notice that sweat over there. So, but I thought that um, this meeting was just as important. Um, so I would make the statement and then we will listen in for a while and have to get back to the office, if, if you don't mind, okay? So, Madam Moderator, can you hear me clearly? Okay, Madam Moderator, distinguished speakers, excellencies, participants all, and all other protocols are observed. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Let me start by thanking the organizers of this event for inviting me to provide the keynote, keynote remarks. I am indeed delighted to be here to speak, and I did make it a priority, just as I said, coming from another event, uh, but I always think, given uh, my role as the chair of the G7 Plus and other peace pl platforms that we're part of, I always like to take the opportunity uh, to talk about um, peace and the SDG 16, uh, which is a product of the G7 uh, Plus and international dialogue. Um, Abby calls it the baby that you birthed, the G7 Plus birthed. Distinguished participants, SDG 16 calls for supporting peaceful and inclusive, peaceful and inclusive societies and providing access to justice for all whilst building effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. To this, Sierra Leone made SDG 16 an accelerator SDG together with SDG 4, education, which implies that its attainment is necessary to achieve other development goals. As the chairing country of the G7 Plus and co-chair of the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building, IDPS, Sierra Leone recognizes peace as a precondition to building resilience, nation building, and socioeconomic development. As a group and a platform for dialogue to promote, and, uh, to promote peace and stability, we are united by the conviction there is no, that there is no development without peace and no peace without development. The example of the 11 year war in Sierra Leone which thankfully is behind us, but is still a reminder to all of us that we need to continue pursuing peace and to never again resort to conflict environment, uh, and violence as a means of settling our differences. We have learned that lesson in Sierra Leone. So even after there had been some brief instability, the path that we chose was moderation and dialogue. Many regard the failed attempts at democratization, on accountability, and bad governments and alienated youths as causes of these wars. And this is why I say that there is no peace without development. If we cannot develop and have accountable structures, our countries will descend into chaos. In this regard, Sierra Leone has made significant strides since the end of the war 
to address these root causes, consolidate peace and improve access to justice through a series of policy changes and institutional reforms. Key amongst the actions taken to improve access to justice is the establishment of the Legal Aid Board of 2015 to provide free legal representation to Sierra Leoneans who cannot afford it. Through this initiative, more than 1,200,000 less privileged persons have received free legal services from the board. Efforts have also been made to digitize the legal system, including design and implement implementation of electronic case management systems. With the support of its development partners, the government has also empowered state institutions, such as the Human Rights Commission of Sierra Leone, the National Commission for Democracy, and the National Youth Commission to enhance inclusion, peaceful coexistence, and de democratic governance. An independent commission for peace and national cohesion has also been recently established. All these reforms have contributed to the country enjoying over two decades of peace and democracy and conducting five successful general elections that are regarded as largely peaceful and credible. In fact, by 2023, the global, the global Peace Index showed that Sierra Leone became the third most peaceful country in Africa and overtaking Ghana as the most peaceful in West Africa. These successes have bolstered Sierra Leone's image in the international community as a successful case of post-war reconciliation and peace building. Consequently, Sierra Leone is back in the UN Security Council as a non-permanent member for the first time in over five decades, contributing to the global peace and security, which we are uh, an achievement that we are very proud of. Despite these gains, however, we feel that there's no room for complacency. And this should never be the case in any country that has been in conflict and come out of conflict. And more efforts should be made by all stakeholders to further improve democratic, good governance and maintain peace and stability. As Sierra Leone is a fragile state in transition, there is always the risk of instability and conflict, especially during elect elect electioneering periods when the political climate is often tense. The political tensions during the elections and the coup attempt of late November in, of 2023 are a, mark, are a stark reminder that we are not completely out of the woods. In terms of national planning, the SDGs have been reflected in the medium term national development plan that we launched today and also, they've been they were reflected in the medium-term national uh, development plan 2019 to 2023. Through this plan, they were represented through four objectives, eight clusters, and 48 subclusters. SDG is reflected in cluster four, which deals more broadly with issues of governance and accountability. Related SDGs such as gender equality are reflected in cluster five, women, children, and PWGs, and six, youth employment. This plan elapsed in December, 2023. And as I mentioned, just about an hour ago. We launch DGs. A 
I think we are having some connection problems. Is that correct from Sierra Leone? Yeah. Um, can you connect with Minister Barley? Minister, you seem to be muted. There was a connection issue and now you... Okay. Yes. There you go. Yes, all right, thank you. So thank I you. was talking about the alignment of the um, both plans to the SDGs and specifically SDG uh, six, uh, 16. Um, since I've given a lot of the background, um, I think you've got enough that could be captured as a keynote. So I think I should move to concluding. And as a final point, I would like to emphasize the cru crucial role of partnerships in fostering peace and stability. Partnerships uh, for us were very evident in our planning process and in implementation. A particularly noteworthy initiative was the peace in the area of um, peace, was the peace pledge that His Excellency, the President, Dr. Julius Madabio, and the presidential candidate of the main opposition party, APC, Dr. Samura Kamara, and other political leaders signed up to during the 2023 elections. Continuing with a practice that started in 2018. This was initiated by the then Interreligious Council of Sierra Leone in partnership with the Council of Paramount Chiefs and supported by regional and global bodies, including ECOWAS and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Through this pledge, and this is this is a good example, you know, for all. Through this pledge, political leaders committed to accept accepting the election results or pursue any grievances through the course. Again, when differences arose from the main opposition party during our last election, a mediated dialogue, as I mentioned, was convened by the Independent Commission for Peace and National Cohesion with mediators from ECOWAS, AU, and the Commonwealth to bridge these differences. I am particularly proud of these initiatives as they are clear examples of how homegrown ideas based on, local, on the local context can make a big impact if adequately supported by other development stakeholders, the stakeholders which were considered as independent parties. In closing, let me take this opportunity to register our unwavering, unwavering commitment to the SDGs and encourage continued partnerships and collective efforts at the national, regional, and with all of you here at the global levels to build a future where peace and inclusivity and prosperity define our world. Together, let us shape a legacy that resonates with the ideals of justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, for these very inspiring words. Um, it's uh, fascinating to hear about the impressive development path that Sierra Leone has taken um, uh, to be build a peaceful and inclusive society. Um, congratulations on the launch of the development plan. Um, also, great to hear um, that you ended um, your speech talking about elections. It's not often that we talk about elections in the context of SDG 16, but uh, we we have to assume that uh, free and fair elections have to be uh, the cornerstone, which cornerstone will which enable uh, inclusive, uh, just, and peaceful institutions to uh, to develop and thrive. Um, and these lessons learned and the and the story about the pledge that was developed in Sierra Leone, I think it's a, it's really a model for other countries to follow, especially during this massive election year that the world has ahead of, uh, in 2024. So thank you so much, Minister, for these uh, very inspiring words. Um, we will now turn over to the panel, um, and we will start with the first panelist, Paula Fernandez Wolf. Uh, who is the Director General of the 2030 Agenda for the Government of Spain. Um, and uh, so we're turning over to Spain, and I would like to, to ask Paula um, how the SDG 16 and its interlinkages to other SDG six, SDGs in the 2030 Agenda is reflected and prioritized in Spain's national um, or local plans and strategy. 
Um, and also, how do you anticipate that, that this will be reflected in Spain's voluntary national review, which I believe Spain will submit um, this year? Um, and maybe also a little bit about the partnership dimension that we've been talking about so much. Over to you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me and, and the, the Spanish government to be present in this um, very special side event. And I say it's very special because, of course, for, for Spain, the issue of partnerships and um, encouraging participation across all stakeholders is, um, is of paramount importance. Let me just note um, in my brief, my very brief uh, intervention that my director, Directorate General is um, located within the Ministry for Social Rights and 2030 Agenda. And I think this is important to note because of the importance that we place to the 2030 Agenda in the context of um, the Spanish government, but also in the context of the, the nexus between human rights and and, um, and, the, and the SDGs, which is a nexus that is oftentimes not so well understood, but, um, but, but I think institutionally in Spain, we take, we take it very seriously. And, and this is something I, I wanted to highlight. Of course, as we all know here, SDG 16 is really um, one of the, all SDGs are obviously important, but um, solid institutions, justice and peace are, of course, a, a, both a cause and a consequence of achieving other SDGs. And so from that perspective, um, I wanted to highlight two main um, uh, areas of, of work that, that we think are, are very important and that we will highlight in our VNR, which as you mentioned, Annika, correctly, we will be presenting this um, in July in July of, of 2024. The first idea is that um, for us, it is really critical to design and implement all public policy priorities in partnership with civil society actors and also other stakeholders. From that perspective, we have a very strong institutional architecture that um, is that, that tries to articulate all of um, all participation of different actors within different um, bodies, so, so to speak. The first one is a sustainable development council where civil society has a very strong voice, but also stakeholders from academia, from the private sector um, from and from other organizations, such as uh, human rights organizations, um, environmental organizations, et cetera. And uh, this is really a, a really a key forum where they can articulate their positions, where we listen as a, as a government, but also as an administration, and um, and also one that is key to localize the the SDGs, which is a, is a big priority for Spain. From that perspective, we also have a second um, main body that is called, in English, we could call it sectoral conference which articulates different levels of government. It um, has the Spain, as, as you might know, has a, a, a regional um, administrative or jurisdictional distribution of, of power. Where, and so in this body, we have um, not only the, the national government, but also regions are represented in this body and also um, municipal local governments have a voice in this body. So really this, this, um, this what we call a conference, but it could be, could be called a, a council, so to speak, we also um, hold discussions at different levels on the implementation of the SDGs and of course this localization of the SDGs as I was, as I was mentioning. And so really within the entire institutional architecture for the 2030 agenda, we have this idea of partnerships um, in mind, both as a government, as a national administration, but also in terms of regional and local um, actors. The second main um, area that, that uh, is, is, is really um, a priority for us is to think about policy interactions and policy coherence, because oftentimes we speak of the SDGs, but we, they are not um, fully mainstreamed uh, in the whole of government approach that, that we would like to prioritize. And so a key goal for Spain, even though this is of course at, at early stages, but we would like to develop and implement a, a policy coherence system that will apply to all administrations, for instance, including normative impact analyses that will take into account the SDGs at every step of the policymaking process from um, design to implementation to even evaluation. Um, in addition, I, I wanted to highlight just a few a few measures that, that we have um, undertaken in the past few years to implement specifically SDG 16, such as a whistleblower protection law that we passed, of course, implementing SDG 16.5 and 6. 
We also have an open government plan um, to improve the accountability of the government and to really strengthen participation in um, policy and lawmaking. And also we have passed several laws to protect sexual freedoms and to protect, um, uh, to prevent violence against children and youth. In addition, I also wanted to highlight that in the context of our VNR, for instance, we have invited our national human rights institution, which is a, a, um, an ombudsman um, uh, uh, specifically that, that has as, as a task to uh, really scrutinize the, the work of the administrations. And as you know, this is a, a very good practice that is encouraged by, by the United Nations as a way to truly mainstream this human rights uh, based approach into uh, the 2030 agenda by bringing in um, our national human rights institution into this exercise. And we're hoping they will participate actively providing advice into uh, around how to articulate, for instance, um, participation of various administrations into the VNR and to reflect on the practical obstacles um, to accessing public services, for example, because they have that unique perspective very much in contact with um, public service users that we will then use in our, in our VNR. Still, I think there are many challenges ahead. One that I mentioned, uh, touched on briefly in terms of uh, policy coherence. This is uh, very early work, um, of course, spearheaded by, by the OECD and other international actors that have done um, a lot of work in this area, and we would like to learn more about this uh, because it's it's uh, it's really important to ensure, for example, this there's gender the gender mainstreaming is really um, implemented in practice uh, across all SDGs, um, as well as, for instance, the the perspective on, on on planetary limits and how that interacts with various SDGs. A second um, challenge I would say is the issue of localization. For us, as I mentioned, um, developing public policies in partnership with different stakeholders is, is incredibly important. Um, and yet sometimes it, it's of course um, understandable that, that um, localizing the SDGs will, uh, will always, um, we will always run into uh, specific practical examples into how to do this. And a third one would be strengthening participation and accountability, which for us is, is also very important. Um, and with this, I close. I look forward to learning more from my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paola. We have heard about a very different context from the Sierra Leonean, but nonetheless, uh, many uh, parallels. Um, thanks for emphasizing the role of human rights institutions. Um, the minister also did that and um, the linkage between the human rights agenda and the 2030 agenda. I think that's very important. Also, thanks for being honest about the challenges ahead um, and um, it's working progress, uh, the implementation of this agenda, but it's really interesting and fascinating to hear uh, the progress that Spain has made and is making towards uh, ensuring policy coherence and, and localizing and coordinating not only with uh, governments at different levels, but also with civil society and other stakeholders. So thank you very much for those perspectives. Um, we will now turn over to our next panelist, um, also a different context, the Norwegian context. Uh, we have Anne Romsas with us, who's the Chief Advisor on SDGs for the Norwegian Association of Local Governments. Um, so we would like to ask you, um, similarly, how SDG 16 and its interlinkages to other SDGs is reflected and prioritized um, in Norway's, um, and in your case, since you're focusing on local governments in local plans and strategies. Um, also uh, hear a little bit about um, the VNR for Norway. I believe VN, um, Norway submitted its last VNR in 2021. Um, how was SDG 16 and its interlinkages featured there? Um, so over to you, Anne. We look forward to hearing your insights from Norway. Thank you, Annika, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share some experiences from uh, the local and regional level. I represent KS, the Norwegian Association of Local and Regional Authorities in, in Norway, and we represent all the municipalities in all the regions, 357 municipalities and 15 regions all across uh, Norway. And in Norway, we have benefited from good relations and existing system of consultation and dialogue between the national government and the municipal sector for years. 
And we are working to strengthen the horizontal and vertical coordination to implement the SDGs. And more can be done to raise awareness about the SDGs and foster this whole of society approach. This is crucial when it comes to securing the SDG 16 and its interlinkages to other SDGs. Um, in this established structure of dialogue made it possible to achieve an inclusive SDG reporting process covering the whole of government when Norway delivered its voluntary national review back in 2021. We knew that the national reports, they tend to fall short when it comes to understanding and explaining local and regional progress towards the SDGs. This is the reason why we agreed to combine national reports with both local uh, reports and subnational reports. So this year, we take this one step further. Together with our Nordic colleagues and the research institution Nur Regio, we are producing a joint Nordic voluntary subnational review. There we are presenting the SDG work local and regional level in all the five Nordic countries. And this report will emphasize the importance of local and regional action, giving in particular a voice to our youth and the indigenous peoples in the Nordic region. We are looking forward to presenting this uh, at the HLPF this summer. KS has also benefited from a political agreement with the country's national uh, government to take joint action on the SDG implementation. This agreement ensured that we transfer knowledge from the voluntary reports into joint action across different levels of government. And many municipalities and many local authorities in Norway base their strategies and planning efforts on the SDGs, both to ensure sustainable service provision and future-oriented local development. In KS, we make efforts to motivate and support and encourage all municipalities work to meet the SDGs. We translate the global goals into a local context. We develop measurement systems for progress. We create arenas for networking and sharing of experiences, as well as encouraging political commitment, willingness to change and citizens acceptance. To succeed with the, the SDGs, new and strong partnerships are needed. The municipalities in Norway already cooperate with business community, with universities and colleges, with NGOs and with citizens to create sustainable, peaceful, just and inclusive societies. And the SDGs offer a common language and ambition to construct just such partnerships on. In Norway, we also benefit from a strong tradition of social dialogue. Building on this, we are working together with the Conf Confederation of Norway Norwegian Enterprises, representing the business side, and the Norwegian Confederation of the Trade Unions, representing the labor side, to join forces with the municipal sector in amplifying the development of sustainable solutions regionally and nationally. We believe in the power of such innovative part collaborations and partnerships as the way forward for sustainable development to secure the voices from all the relevant actors and parties and to build the needed solutions together. It's uh, crucially uh, important to also be able to see the, the policy coherence when, when it comes to the um, SDG 16 and its it interlinkages with other SDGs and the municipal sector and the regional sector in Norway is working um, heavily on being able to do this. And we are trying to support them with the tools and the frameworks, making it possible for them to, to assess this. So thank you. Um, I look very much forward to learning from my peers in this uh, panelist and uh, I'm looking forward to the discuss following discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, very interesting to hear about the Norwegian experience and, and the innovation that you are um, putting forward this year. Um, not only are you innovating, you're submitting a multi-country uh, VNR, but also uh, reflecting uh, advances at the local level. So we really look forward to uh, looking at that product when it's done. Um, now we will turn to our uh, final panelist.
Um, sorry, um, some technological issues. So, Liz Yu, um, Liz, can you share with us some concrete examples of innovative partnerships, grassroots mobilization, and institution building around SDG 16 plus, and particularly around peace building, that are truly inspiring for the audience to hear? Over to you, Liz. Great, thank you so much. I first want to just start off and say peace building in general. If you go back to the 1990s, it wasn't even a word. Uh, it wasn't a word. Uh, you know, if you told people what you were working on, people would say, what, what? I don't even understand what that means. So I think it's really important for us to say we've come a long way. And SDG 16 is the perfect example of that. Um, the Secretary General talks about peace building and conflict prevention all the time. So these are really important things uh, you know, to celebrate, but there's a lot more work that has to be done. But they came about not because you know, one person had a great idea, it came about through collective action and working together. However, the peace building field for numerous reasons, whether it's lack of resources and competition, we tend to be a bit more siloed and dispersed. So there's a lot of work that remains, but we, you know, so what is the answer? We have to work more closely together, collaboratively, collectively. And a lot of donors don't wanna fund that. Um, and that's a really big issue. Research, um, and in fact, AFP feels so strongly about this that we built our 10 year strategy around this. Um, so the Alliance for Peacebuilding, we're a membership-based organization. We have over 200 members. We take a really big tent approach. If you're working on peace building, come and join us. And not only do we say come and join us, we join other networks to amplify other networks like the TAP network, like CSPPS. We feel very strongly that that is how we are going to build champions and really make this systemic change around conflict prevention and peace building. We don't have to, you know, we know, this is, I don't have to tell this crowd, since 2018, we have hit global violent conflict record highs and we keep breaking them every year. And it's not just those conflicts over there. Um, the Eurasia report uh, that was released yesterday by foreign policy talked about one of the greatest threats to security is America, America's war of it, with itself. We're having significant challenges in the global north as well. And that's why SDG 16 is something that needs to be championed, but we also have to be reflective about it, knowing where its weaknesses are, and more importantly, that it applies globally, not just to those countries in the global south, but also in the global north. So I think that that is such an incredible piece of SDG 16 and it didn't just happen. These, these things don't just happen, they happen because of collective voices and collective action. Um, and you know, the research, when we did our strategy, really, we, we, we really researched what networks were. Um, you know, a lot of people would say, okay, what is AFP? What is this organization? Is it a, is it a network? Is it a coalition? Is it a this? And we used to say, what does it matter? We're working on this together. Well, the good thing is that in the last 20 years, there has been so much research on how do you do systemic change? And it really does show that, you know, building champions, unlocking the systemic change for greater impact, no one organization can do it alone. Scaling individual organizations doesn't do it. You need this collective action, this network uh, to, to do this work. So no, and it's right front and center, center in our strategy. No organization um, you know, can do this alone. Uh, we take on issues that are too big for any organization to tackle on itself. So I can't stress the importance of, you know, not only this is what we know, but it's what the research shows. So I, I really want to emphasize this over and over again and the importance of the TAP network 
on SDG 16, for example, because we have a lot of work to do. And especially this year as SDG 16 um, is getting reviewed. Let's be honest, they were developed in 2014 and who doesn't wanna go back to 2014 um, in terms of uh, where the world was, um, um, it, there was less conflict, uh, you know, there was, uh, it, it was a different time. Conflict actually was declining. Um, so there's a lot of focus on the SDGs, uh, especially SDG 16, that we need to look at how do we focus in on a positive side of it, not just the negative side of it. We know how important social cohesion is, for example. But one of the most important pieces about SDG 16, and this is something that um, as a network, as a collective action, working together, where we are going to have the most systemic change in the next 10 years is around integration. Integrating conflict prevention and peace building into other sectors. And that is exactly what SDG 16 says. So the health sector, you know, we don't have to look any, any, you know, any farther than COVID. We now know countries that had better, you know, stronger social cohesion did better, even though they sat high on the pandemic uh, list, like the United States. Um, so we need to make sure that conflict prevention and peace building is integrated into these other sectors robustly, like health, like education, like technology. And that is only going to happen through building strong networks, working together, championing each other's work. Um, this is the way forward. Um, and we know how important it is because we know what we're facing. Um, you know, again, things are getting uh, much tougher in the world. Um, our conflict records breaking. So I, you know, I, I urge people, I beg people, join these networks, get involved and work together. That is the only way that we are going to solve the most pressing problems of our times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, for your inspiring words and for sharing uh, the Alliance for Peace Building's experience and emphasizing and reminding us of the importance of coalitions, networks, partnerships, we can achieve much more working collectively together than if we work on our own. Um, and also thanks for reminding us all of the, the global nature of the 2030 agenda and that this is not the responsibility just of the global south, but of the global north as well. We all have challenges and issues and we can learn a lot from each other. So this is truly a global agenda and that's the unique um, um, value of, of this um, agenda. Um, I um, erroneously said that you were the last panelist, but uh, of course uh, we have our final panelist joining us now. So uh, Swati Mehta from Pathfinders uh, is gonna be the final panelist before uh, we um, hand over to uh, an interactive dialogue with the audience. Uh, Swati Mehta, you are the um, Director of the Justice for All program of Pathfinders. And we were wondering if you can share with us also some examples uh, from your work of innovative partnerships and grassroots mobilization and institution building around SDG 16 plus, particularly around access to justice. Over to you, Swati. Thank you, Anika. Um, and thank you uh, for everyone for joining us today. Um, let me begin by thanking our co-organizers, TAP Network and International IDEA for partnering with us on this very important and timely event. We all know we are in the second half of the 2030 agenda, and we all know that we are woefully off track. Um, goal 16 is one of the most poorly performing goals, and yet ironically, it is a critical enabler for achieving other goals. You cannot address poverty, reduce inequalities, or address the fallout from climate change without peace and justice. Um, as Anika mentioned, as a justice practitioner, I'll focus on SDG 16.3, which calls for promotion of rule of law and ensuring equal access to justice for all. Given the huge justice gap where 5.1 billion people, one, you know, 
lack um, meaningful access to justice, accelerating action on SDG 16.3 requires a transformative approach. It requires putting people and their needs at the center of justice systems, and that this should be based on data, understanding what they want and what they need when they seek justice. It also needs um, ensuring fair outcomes for people by preventing and resolving justice problems. Um, this, of course, requires innovative policies. It requires partnerships. Um, over 60 countries have now endorsed uh, what is called the pe principles of people-centered justice. Today, uh, like my fellow panelists, I would like to focus on solutions and not problems and talk about what is happening on innovative institutional policies and on partnerships, as Anika said. Um, let me begin by citing two examples of innovative and people-centered um, justice policies from Kenya, as well as, as, as Sierra Leone. And we heard the minister talk about Sierra Leone. I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, in Kenya, uh, for example, embracing the reality that most Kenyans do not seek justice in the courts, the Kenyan judiciary created the alternative justice systems policy to engage proactively with customary and informal justice systems. So under this policy, what people can do is they can choose to get justice through customary and informal justice systems, which have been trained on constitutional imperatives to protect rights. It reflects the lived reality of Kenyans and brings justice closer to them. And it also helps reduce backlogs and delays in courts. The policy is new and its impact will be known in the coming years, but it certainly seems like the right step, uh, step in the right direction, reaching people where they are to prevent and solve their problems. Um, I will invite you to read our latest report on Kenya, which one of my colleagues can post in the chat to learn more about some of the challenges, successes, and opportunities of the policy in Kenya, and to think about how this may be relevant to your own context. Coming very quickly to Sierra Leone, which in 2022 enacted two new laws to safeguard people's land rights. The Customary Land Rights Act and the National Land Commission Act seeks, you know, seek to bolster the protection of rural landowners and women in particular. They grant all local communities the right to free prior informed consent over all industrial projects on their lands. They ban industrial development, including mining, timber, and agribusiness in old forests, uh, old growth forests, and other ecological sensitive areas. And they establish land use committees, local land use committees, to make decisions about how community lands are managed and mandate that those committees comprise at least 30% women. Now, these laws not only serve as practical examples of people-centered justice policy, but also illustrate the cross-cutting nature of SDG 16 with clear touch points with goal five on gender equality, getting women into land committees, which was never happening, and goal 15 to protect the terrestrial ecosystem. And there are many, many examples of countries trying to do this, but let me very quickly now come to uh, the issue of partnerships in achieving SDGs. And there are, again, several examples, and we've heard of examples of partnerships and alliances already through our partners, but on justice, there are examples of global, regional, and domestic multi-stakeholder partnerships, which are showing the way. At a global level, we have the Justice Action Coalition, which is a multi-stakeholder, high-ambition coalition, comprising 20 countries, 18 organizations, championing access to justice for all. It has played a key role in drawing attention to the importance of people-centered justice at UN events and processes by making joint statements at EHLPF, at the UN Sixth Committee deliberations, but also going further by actually influencing uh, UN's, the way UN engages with rule of law, the coalition's you know, joint letter to the Secretary General led to SG's report on common agenda, recognizing justice as an essential dimension of social contract and to the launch of a new vision for rule of law, which clearly states that rule of law is people-centered. The coalition has also done a lot to produce data and evidence. It has produced 10 joint deliverables as part of a shared research agenda on justice. And again, I'll invite you to visit our website. Maybe my colleague can paste something on these research documents that have been produced as part of a coalition working jointly to create better data and better evidence. Pathfinder serves as a secretary to the coalition. 
Um, at, again, I'm mindful of the time. Very quickly, uh, another example I would like to cite is that of the Ibero-American Alliance, which is a regional alliance on access to justice, which is also a very concrete example of innovative partnership. Now, this alliance is an action-oriented regional alliance comprising non-government organizations, governmental and intergovernmental agencies, and civil society organizations. It has COMHEB, which is the ministers of justice, prosecutors, public defenders, CSOs, all coming together at a regional level to accelerate implementation of SDG 16.3 in the region with a special focus on data and innovation, on creating and promoting a regional normative framework on access to justice, and to ensure that you know, regional actors' efforts to leave no one behind actually a feed into the SDG agenda. I am very uh, Pathfinders does serve as the as the secretariat to this alliance as well, and I'm because I'm mindful of the time, looking keeping my eye on the clock there. Um, I will stop here, but I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Swati, um, for your inspiring words, um, hearing the work of, of the Justice Action Coalition and other coalitions, the importance of multi-stakeholder coalitions where civil society comes together, but also in collaboration with academia and, and with governments to, to really achieve progress on the, on the 2030 agenda. And uh, something that Liz said in her previous intervention, also the importance of coalitions and collective action, but also of coalitions joining other coalitions so that all these coalitions that exist out there actually work together to achieve even greater impact. Um, we will now turn to the interactive uh, feature of this session. Uh, I will hand this over to John Romano, the director of the TAP network to lead this exercise. He will um, teach us all how to use a Mentimeter. And um, so I'll hand this over to, to you, John. Great. Thanks a lot, Annika, and thanks uh, to our speakers for a very uh, rich uh, discussion. Um, yeah, now moving over to a little bit more of a, an interactive portion of this event. Uh, I'm sure for those of you that have attended uh, other TAP network uh, events, uh, know that we like to use this tool, Mentimeter, um, to really get a sense uh, of what colleagues in the room are thinking and how you're feeling, provide your insights. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, quickly here. Um, and so just to explain uh, what we're doing here, um, really, um, yeah, um, for logistical purposes, we'll put a link in the chat box. Um, anyone can access this link um, to utilize, uh, to provide your insights through this poll. You can also um, log on on your mobile device or your computer, just go to menti.com. And then you can use the code here at the top of the screen. Uh, the code is 44913039. Uh, and that uh, will allow you to provide your insights here. Basically, what we have here is uh, a word cloud. You provide your insights. Uh, we'll see um, how frequently uh, uh, some of these terms are used. The bigger they are, the more it's being referenced. Um, so we'll wait for you know, some colleagues to uh, provide some insights. This is just a warm up question. Uh, what does SDG 16 plus mean to you? What, when you think about SDG 16, what issues come to mind? We've heard a little bit about um, some of the interlinkages uh, between uh, SDG 16 plus and all other SDGs. So on top of you know, peace and justice, um, inclusion, strong institutions, uh, what else uh, do you see as connected with SDG 16 plus? Um, and also, while uh, while we talk about partnerships as well, um, uh, I think just uh, again thinking about where the entry points for this discussion uh, will be shared. Um, we also hope to deliver uh, the results and and some of the key messages from this. Uh, event today uh, to the official SDG 16 action segment later today at the ECOSOC partnership um, forum. Um, so this will contribute uh, directly to uh, the official outcomes from the ECOSOC partnerships forum. Um, and on, on that note, um, also in addition to you know thanking our partners from International uh, IDEA and the Pathfinders, 
I also wanted to, uh, to mention, um, you know, that this event is also supported from our colleagues from uh, the Civil Society Platform for Peace Building and State Building, um, IDLO, um, Wafuna, and UNDP. Uh, and UNDP uh, is helping to support that SDG 16 action segment and will help us ensure that these messages are shared uh, into the partnerships forum. Um, so, okay, I think we're seeing <laughs> justice, peace, inclusion. I think... Uh, that's fairly self-explanatory. I see uh, participation, transparency, peace building, uh, violence reduction. I see a lot around collaboration and partnership, integration. Uh, okay, this is a great uh, way for us to kind of warm up a little bit uh, here. We'll, we'll move to the next question uh, and get into the details, um, the difficult questions here on, you know, how can we utilize partnerships uh, to strengthen SDG 16 uh, implementation. So we heard a little bit about some of, you know, where some of the partnerships are and some ideas from the, the panelists. Um, so curious to see, uh, again, where are some of the areas that you feel we need additional um, support uh, around? Um, and you may be prompted in front of you um, in the poll, um, just click go to the next question. Uh, and it'll bring you up to be able to provide your um, keywords for this uh, question. Um, and as as we wait for results to come in, I also wanted to highlight on our side um, uh, another partnership uh, that the TAP Network um, also uh, coordinates and facilitates. Um, it's called the SDG 16 Now campaign. So. Um, I know that many of you have seen uh, many uh, partners and familiar faces uh, in the attendee list, so thanks for joining us. But for those that uh, aren't already part of the SDG 16 Now campaign, uh, this is really a campaign to help us, you know, as, as Liz mentioned, how do we connect and unite some of the like-minded organizations um, that work on SDG 16, bring them all together, um, really to push for more concrete action um, and um, partnership around um, SDG 16 plus. Um, so a lot of different strands to that work. Um, really big thanks to all of our partners from last year to help us building that momentum towards this year. Again, a very important year uh, with the summit of the future ahead of us, a lot of entry points for SDG 16 issues around uh, peace and the new agenda for peace uh, and justice, participation, uh, governance, um, good governance. Um, so a lot of areas for us and entry points um, for the SDG 16 Now campaign. So we'll share some more information in the chat box around how you can join that campaign uh, and join this movement um, to call for more action on SDG 16. Um, okay, we have a really diverse uh, response here on where we can strengthen partnerships. I see the biggest one here, accountability. I think that's... Uh, something on a lot of people's minds. I think we ne need better accountability across SDG 16 and the SDGs overall. Advocacy, local governments, research, transparency. Okay, great. Um, so um, we'll uh, stop here. Um, I know, uh, again, um, there's plenty of other you know, opportunities for us to, to dive a bit deeper into all of these issues. So um, again, a thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for providing your insights, but uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Annika uh, for, for opening up the floor and the discussion. Again, um, for those that do want more information, we'll share everything coming from um, this uh, meeting uh, here uh, with you after. And, and again, um, hopefully um, in making sure that all of these insights and key messages make its way into the ECOSOC Partnerships Forum from here. So thanks again for, for your insights and, and for contributing. Thank you so much, uh, John, and thanks for everyone uh, for participating in, in this uh, poll. Um, one of the things that stood out in, in one of the Mentimeters was um, that I reacted to. There were many issues, of course, the opportunity for collaboration that these partnerships give, um, advancing collective action on the 2030 agenda and on SDG 16. Uh, one of the large words was collaborating around research and, and data, uh, collecting better data. And 
Um, so I would like to make a plea, John, you were uh, encouraging everyone to join the SDG 16 campaign. Uh, also for you to know that we are all we are also collaborating in the SDG 16 data initiative, which is also a coalition of partner organizations, uh, multi stakeholder uh, that produce complementary data to help track progress on SDG 16. Um, now we'll, uh, we have 10 minutes left of our session and uh, we have a couple of um, people that have um, uh, lined up to provide some comments. Um, and the first one that I have here on my list is from UNDP, Alessandro Ercolani. Are you there, Alessandro? And uh, would you like to share some thoughts uh, with us yes. today? Thanks, Annika, and thanks to John and, and uh, all the speakers and panelists. Um, my name is Alessandro Ercolani. I'm a governance analyst and UNDP's Bureau for Policy and Program Support in New York. And I just wanted to quickly reflect on a couple of um, extremely important uh, points that were raised by uh, a, a few different panelists. First of all, the issue of partnership and partnerships. I think it's, uh, this is something that we're going to repeat uh, later today at the official SDG 16 action segment. Um, and we're going to repeat tomorrow at the coordination segment. Uh, uh, with member states. Um, it is one of the very reasons why we're part, UNDP is part of the SDG 16 uh, plus coalition uh, together with International IDEA, TAG, Pathfinders and a few others. Um, and another point that I wanted to quickly reflect on is the issue of, is of partnership for better data. Um, um, and that links to something that uh, Elizabeth mentioned around the need to look to mobilize the donor community around investment for um, research on interlinkages, uh, for networks. Um, we need to show that there is an actual benefit uh, around identifying these interlinkages, implementing interlinkages. Um, and that SDG 16 has uh, a catalytic role in achieving the rest of the agenda. Um, we're doing that in a few areas. We just launched our insights reports um, where we analyze more than 95 countries and, and we try to understand what are the SDG pathways um, that can maximize national investment to achieve um, 17 SDGs and for example it comes out that um, effective uh, and responsive institutions uh, are a driver of societal well-being overall um, and they bear benefits for uh, social protection for example and and uh, uh, and other SDGs we also conducted uh, research um, with the German Development Institute um, uh, on, on linkages with uh, uh, poverty, inequality, protection of marine environment, and we found the same uh, positive spillovers. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. One last thing um, on, the, on the links between human rights and SDGs, this is of extreme importance to us. Uh, we also released recently a guidance note on streaming human rights in BNRs, and we invite you to take a look at that. Um, and I'm out of time. Thank you very much for uh, giving me these two minutes. Uh, over back to you, Annika. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandro, for these uh, good insights, uh, the importance of, of data uh, and uh, more funding to, to really strengthen the evidence base um, on the interlinkages between SDG 16 and the rest of the 2030 agenda. Uh, Alessandro, may I ask that you send the link in the chat to these various publications that you referenced and, and that I think will be val very course. valuable for all of us to, to read. Um, we have some more discussions uh, on the list. Uh, I wanted to know if Natya Tsikaradze is there from the government of Georgia. Yes, yes, I'm here. 
Wonderful. Over to you, Nadia. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. So I would, uh, I, I will be very brief, uh, uh, and I will mention the importance of SDG 16 for Georgia. It's uh, Georgia incorporates SDG 16 into its national development strategies and plans, and this involves aligning the country's overall development goals with the uh, targets and indicators of SDG 16 and. Georgia has been working on building effective and inclusive institutions, and this includes efforts to enhance transparency and accountability. The country has undertaken significant reforms aimed at enhancing its governance uh, system. The adoption of one-stop uh, one shop approach for service delivery has become an example of many countries, and the expansion of public service accessibility through transformative initiatives like public service halls, community centers, and citizens portal like MyGovG. And building up on this uh, prior achievement, the government of Georgia, uh, in pursuit of bolstering uh, uh, democracy, good governance, transparency, and accountability, as well as uh, elevating the quality of service provision to citizens at every level, introduced the public administration reform in 2015 and the establishment of an effective and efficient public administration was identified as a fundamental objective uh, serving as the cornerstone of a well-functioning state. And this commitment was enriched in the public administration reform strategy 2020 and corresponding uh, action plans. And furthermore, the significance of public administration reform is clearly articulated in key national policy documents, such as the government program for 2021 and 2024 and development strategy of Georgia uh, Vision 2030. And, uh, Georgia uh, has also a new per strategy, public administration reform strategy that was approved uh, last year. And as as, uh, as part of the public administration reform, two key pillars stand out, the policy planning pillar and the public service delivery pillar. And these pillars have witnessed remarkable achievements within their respective domains. Notably, some of these accomplishments include development of um, unified public policy planning framework and the respective uh, software and the unified standard for policy planning and implementation has introduced a common approach towards initiative implementing monitoring uh, the policy cycle in the country with this new standard to be ensured that all policy documents are linked with the SDGs and uh, uh, this SDG 16 is one of the important uh, goal for uh, aligning uh, it uh, in, in our policy documents. And the second pillar I would like, uh, the second achievement I would like to mention is the introduction of service design, delivery quality assurance and costing policy adopted by the government of Georgia. The unified uh, service policy covers all aspects uh, of uh, public service development and it's based on internationally recognized participatory uh, methodologies such as design thinking, user-centered design, digitalization, and etc. And introduction of policy uh, coupled with uh, capacity building activities has increased uh, uh, the awareness of public servants towards the importance uh, of user engagement in service developments uh, um, and incorporation of citizen feedback into the re-engineering of public services. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadia, for sharing the experience of, of Georgia. Uh, we are coming to the end of this event. Um, Okay, so I think we we will not be able to go to have all the discussions that had listed themselves talk, but we will have from civil society um, that can share their views. Uh, Dr. Yotsna Mohan Singh from the Asia Development Alliance, over to you, and then we'll wrap up the session. Thank you so much, Anika. Thank you, John, and thank you for all the great speakers, for their great um, speeches. Um, some of the points that I wanted to uh, follow up here is about one word that we hear uh, 
localization. Why are we talking about localization? You know, because when it said that SDGs were the bottom up approach, that means it they were supposed to be already localized. So why don't we use the term locally led development or something else? Because localization still looks like a very much you know top down approach. And the other thing that I wanted to you know uh, very quickly talk about uh, the whole issue of justice. You know, when we're talking about SDG 16 plus, then we have to talk about the, the issues of redistributive justice. For example, I mean, you know, I know in my region, 0.001% of the people, they have, they acquire about 30% of the wealth. You know, at the same time, when we talk about the ODA, the developed, the developed country, they need to take the responsibility, you know, because um, uh, earlier we used to say that 0.7% of the GNI should be devoted for to the uh, to the ODA, but now it's like two percent. So please, uh, so there's another thing that you know we really need to have the transparent approach and the, let's talk about the redistributive and economic justice. We also need to talk about the environmental justice, so and then gender and social justice. And the other thing that I wanted to uh, to talk about is the whole issue of the shrinking civic space. Um, I mean, we are talking about, you know, hold the issue of partnership, but then the civil society, uh, their voices are being muted. I mean, especially in my region, if you look at the Southeast Asian countries or South Asian countries, the civil society have hardly any say. When the SDGs are already regressing, we will not be able to achieve SDGs until 2065. And some of the indicators, some of the goals like gender would be achieved only in 200 years from now. And then we are already talking about the summit of the future. So. I sometimes wonder, or we civil society in Asia Pacific region, we really feel that isn't it is it an attempt to divert to, to, to divert the whole attention from the failing from the failing SDGs to the summit of the future. So I think we really we really need to have a lot, lot of advocacy and communication on why are we talking about I mean the whole issue of summit of the future. Because I afraid that with this we might uh, the attention might get diverted. So I think these are some of the points that I wanted to highlight and I wanted to uh, the I wanted the uh, wanted the uh, esteemed speakers to uh, to uh, to understand our points from the global south point of view. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Josna, and also for reminding us of um, the issue of, of civic space, uh, which is also a fundamental precondition for um, achieving SDG 16. Um, we have come to the end of our session, but I would like to give one minute to our dear colleague and partner, Henk Jan Brinkman from IDLO, to say just a few words. But can I ask you to be brief, Henk Jan, and then we will wrap up the conversation. Over to you, Henk Jan. No, great. Thank you so much. I, um, I, I just, indeed, 60 seconds. Um, I just wanted to mention... Um, uh, the Pact for the Future, a desired draft is on the table. There are a couple of good elements in there, but there are also a few things missing. Uh, one is people-centered justice. And um, that is something that we all need to advocate for and fully agree with Liz um, that we need to have coalitions together to really make this happen. And the other thing that is there but really need to be strengthened is that we need to push against uh, military approaches to uh, peace and security. We need to focus on dialogue, inclusivity, and peace building, as, as uh, Liz and others have also uh, emphasized. So there's a little bit of work to be done. One good thing also in the pact is the uh, target of halving the number of violent deaths. Um, this is something that, that we have advocated for, and there's a whole campaign around it, but the text is in there and we need to keep it. Um, so thanks so much. Thanks so much, Heng Yan, for uh, reminding us uh, that the draft uh, of the Pact of the Future is out, encouraging you all to provide comments. Thanks for already pointing us to where the gaps are. Um, and thanks to everyone that participated today. Uh, we've had a really interesting discussion. I'm so glad that we focused on solutions, on good practices, rather than uh, just pointing out where the failures are. It's very important to, to balance with um, constructive policy solutions and hear the experiences from different parts of the world. So big thanks to all our speakers and for all those who listen in on this event, and we can look forward to continue the conversation going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.